Hello friends, it's Kayla. Thank you so much for coming back to my channel. It's time, reluctantly, for another wrap up. Here are my stats of the month. I read, oh, I don't know, 24 things. Most of them are represented here. I, um, let's get it out of the way. Didn't have a new five star. I'm in a five star drought. I am very depressed about my reading. My average rating for April was a 3.4. I read a lot of three stars and four stars, which is great. We're gonna talk about them. I'm gonna recommend them. I just like, I want a new shiny five star favorite. I wanna feel alive. So I decided to organize it today based on the author that I would read from again the most to an author that I will not be reading from again. And this actually is not indicative of my ratings for the books, but I'll talk about that throughout the video. We're gonna start with my one reread of the month. Thank goodness I did it because this was my only five star read of the month. I did have a five star, but it was not a new five star. It's The Book of the Most Precious Substance by Sarah Grant. I've talked about this multiple times before. So the quick rundown is it's about this woman named Lily who's a rare book dealer. She hears about this book about sex magic and the occult and becomes obsessed with tracking down this book and perhaps she can use its magical properties to help her husband who has a brain injury. And along the way, she just like goes on all of these various side quests, meets with all of these people she thinks might have the book, might want the book. Uh, she gets into dangerous circumstances, has some sex. They put their fluids inside the book and everybody gets what they want from the book, maybe. <laughs> um, obviously I'm gonna read Sarah Grant over and over again because she has this just very unique horror genre that she's in. And another author I'm obviously going to read everything from is Stephen Graham Jones. I'm very excited that I slipped in The Angel of Indian Lake as my final read of the month. This rounds out the Indian Lake trilogy. My Heart is a Chainsaw, Don't Fear the Reaper, and then The Angel of Indian Lake. You're following a character named Jade who has a lot of trauma, who um, lives in an area where a lot of bad things are happening and she recognizes it because she is a horror movie connoisseur as a serial killer in her town and she assigns everybody a role and they're gonna play out their destiny. And in this one, we are years later. It feels very much like a movie trilogy. Um, you come back to the character, you see their growth, you see them accomplish all of these things and it wrapped up really, really well. I think that you have to like both of the other two books in order to love this. Like if you didn't like the first one, but you persevered and read the second and loved it because there was so much more action and it wasn't just in Jade's head quite as much. This one has an equal amount of action, but you get Jade a lot. And um, I just think you need to love both of them to love this one. Stephen Graham Jones, the reason I will read him time and time again is just, he is such a unique author. He's so weird. And just the way that he writes books, he doesn't hold your hand. He doesn't even set up scenes in a traditional way, descriptions in a traditional way. You have to be really familiar with a lot of horror movies, especially in this trilogy, to fully grasp everything that he's referencing. And then you have to remember a lot of past events and past characters because he's not going to help you out with any information. There's like three things all happening at once all the time. It's very chaotic and I just really loved the ending of this. I ended up giving this a four just because I never give a sequel a five. It just doesn't happen for me. Next up I have Bloom by Delilah S. Dawson. I gave the last book I read from her a three. This one was a four but I have her so high on the list because I just think there's something special about her writing style that I really jive with and I could see her 10 years down the line, five more published books from now, being a favorite author of mine. This I'm gonna go ahead and call a domestic suspense with a good amount of descriptive gore. So it's about these two women who meet at a farmer's market and they begin a relationship. One of them has this very established life, a homestead, uh, takes stuff to the farmer's market, bakes bread, has a very simple, beautiful farm type life but she is clearly hiding something from our other main character, Rosemary, and she becomes obsessed with Ash. Ash becomes obsessed with her. They are keeping secrets from each other and it's just this slow descent into their relationship and finding out the truth about, I don't know, the dark things that are going on behind the scenes. That's pretty much what the synopsis implies. I had a good time with it. Will Dean is up next. For some reason, I put him above an author that I've read like, 
10 times, um, even though this is the first thing that I've read from him. I just feel like if I'm looking for a really fast paced action thriller in the future, I will not hesitate to pick up something from him. This got close to a five. I'm giving it a 4.5, maybe 4.25. And it's hard to explain because the synopsis is very vague and it really does not encompass what the actual story is but you need to find that out for yourself so we follow this woman who is going on a cruise with her boyfriend there are all there are all these people on the ship um they're very well established they talk to all of these people it has a good atmosphere and then she wakes up alone and everybody is gone on the entire ship, including her boyfriend. The evidence of everybody is still left behind. She's like, people's stuff is there. She's going through people's rooms. She's trying to like stop the ship because she doesn't even know where it's headed. There's no crew, there's no anybody. And that's all that you're allowed to know. <laughs> I said in my vlog, I can't remember the page number, but I said like, give it 130 pages or 160 pages because there is a reveal when you come to understand what everything means. And then from there, it's very action packed and fun and still mysterious, but you have to get to like the actual reveal before you give up on it. Cause I've seen a lot of people DNF it cause it's just like slow and you're like, is this woman just gonna be alone? And just like wandering around? forever until the boat like crashes or she dies from starvation like this can't be the whole book i think it got very good and very interesting and i would read from him again then i have emily henry which like yeah i've read every single one of her books i feel like i eventually need to stop because have i have i absolutely desperately loved an emily henry adult novel no <laughs> her books are just so fun i love her writing i love her characters it's just the plot is never a five for me. Everything kind of devolves into what other people are looking for in romance, which is like sweet and wholesome and like warm and sentimental and like let's explore our trauma and like work together through it. And like you all know I want a rom-com, but I always have such a good time reading her books. They hold my attention. I never want to put them down. They're just you know they're usually in the threes and I'm not mad at it I just feel like eventually I probably shouldn't continue picking them up but I'm sure I will because 3.5 is nothing to scoff at this is about two characters who become unexpected roommates when their respective partners break up with them and get together and now Miles and Daphne are kind of fake dating to make the other two jealous they want to go attend their wedding because their relationship moved very quickly there's a lot of jealousy happening and they want to create their own by pretending to be together and also you know they're dealing with a lot of personal stuff jobs and family all the things you would expect from a romance the gimmick was not as gimmicky as I needed like I want fake dating to be just a bigger investment for the characters and the time in the book spent exploring that that was not a good sentence um I think a lot of people will love that I thought it was good another author that I'm interested to read more from is Tracy Sierra I think whatever her next thing is I'll pick it up. This is Night Watching. It was my Literally Dead book club pick of the month and it had mixed ratings for sure but a lot of people seem to give it a four which is what I gave it and this is about a woman who wakes up in the middle of the night and there is a stranger in her house and she quickly gathers up her children and goes and hides in this secret kind of room. It's not like a bunker. It's not like a panic room situation. It's just this kind of corner of her house that nobody would know was there unless they built the house. And she needs to survive, her and her children, as she hears this man walking all around the house looking for them, trying to find them, trying to lure them out, and her desperate desire to save her children's lives. It is such an interesting book and I'm really glad we got to unpack it in the live show because there's a lot of nuance in here. I think what this book most successfully did was bait you into victim blaming and make you really reflect on yourself as a reader because there are so many moments that I feel are intentional of her doing stupid things, her making poor decisions, her you know not communicating the right thing in the right moment and it feels so suspenseful as the reader but also infuriating. And you have to recognize that she is she doesn't read 50 mystery novels a year like we do. She doesn't know the best thing to do in every scenario. She just had this thing happen to her. It's not her fault. And it could happen to anybody. It was just so tension filled. It wasn't my perfect mystery 
or suspense. This is pretty purely suspense in my mind. Um, but I had such an interesting time with it. Moving on to V. Castro, who is an author I've read two books from before and gave them four stars each. Really liked them. This is Immortal Pleasures and I gave it a one star. And the reason it's so high up here is because I know I like this author and I know that she can pull off such unique writing and experiences. Um, and because of the way this was written, I really hated it. And you're in a first person perspective. And so I could say it accomplished its goals because you're reading from this 500 year old Aztec vampire who is reflecting on her life and her wanting to reclaim her history because it's been mistold over time. Her people have been killed. Um, she has been enslaved and it's about her taking charge of her own narrative. But because it's written by her, it's not like V. Castro telling us a story in third person and all the beautiful description and interesting stuff that's normally in her books, I feel. It's not, it's like cold. It's very clinical. And maybe that is the voice of the character that wants to be in this book, but I did not like it. I don't think her way of navigating through time was enjoyable to read. I don't think the way that she explored frequent sex scenes, which I was expecting because look at the cover, look at the title. It's not what I had hoped with this like sultry vampire gothic novel, right? It was more her constantly referencing like, I don't know, her asshole being like a monstrous squid, like <laughs> sucking at its enemies. I'm sorry if that's too vulgar for you, but I really want people to go into this knowing that it's so weird. And I don't think this pitches itself as being weird. I think it's it sounds like it's gonna be something else. Because also there's this romance in here between her and a man and they seem to be kind of like faded mates but that isn't even the person that she's hooking up with for so much of the book and then their romance is just like I, I didn't I didn't like it. I don't think it was well described. I don't think the pacing of this made any sense. She's constantly reflecting on her past while engaging in activities, while being interviewed about being a vampire. And it's just like, it's just all very cold. The person learning about her vampirism, I wanted to enjoy him. And he it was just like, he was just so accepting instantly of her being a vampire. I was like, oh, tell me all about it. And it felt just like silly. So, so, so much info dump about things that didn't actually affect the plot. I think that was my biggest struggle was I was learning about all of this stuff that happened and history and it didn't actually impact what was happening in the current day storyline. This is, this is less than 300 pages. Like I need actual plot, but instead she would be like, oh, I saw a bottle of Tabasco sauce. That reminded me of this massacre. Oh, there's a bottle of Cholula sauce. That reminded me of this massacre I saw one time. And I understand the desire to add history into a book like this, but it just didn't like make any sense. I had an objectively bad time with it. So that's that. Next up, I have Percival Everett because I just have this feeling that this author could be a favorite of mine. I gave this a four, but I said in the vlog that maybe I need to reread it because I feel like part of me could give this a five if I read it a second time knowing like what it actually is about. I just have a sense that I could really love this author. And I know that James is something that came out recently that everyone's been really, I don't know if everyone's been loving it, but I've seen a lot of people reading it. Satire doesn't always land for me, but I tend to like it. And if I found an author who writes satire that I like, maybe like this could be a favorite all time author. This book is about this uh, detective group who is investigating these crimes. The first one we read about is where they find this, these two men dead next to each other. One of them is white, one of them is black. And we have an entire white, like racist um, detective team who is looking at them and saying, well, the white man is the victim and the black man obviously killed him. So now we need to figure out like why and what happened. And by the time they get back to the, oh my God, wherever you take dead bodies to investigate them, uh, the black man is gone and he's just vanished and they can't figure out how. And then another crime occurs and the same dead black man is there. And they realize he looks really similar to Emmett Till and people start to believe that it is Emmett Till. And we have a character in the book who 
is the woman who in history, um, you know, accused Emmett Till of flirting with her, coming on to her, whatever didn't actually happen. And it dives into her and her family and guilt um, because she admits to lying about the entire thing. And then these crimes are occurring all over the country the exact same way, the exact same man. And it's this really funny book somehow just the way the characters interact and how vivid they all are these are some of the most vivid characters that i have read out of anything here i still remember all of them and then that detective team no longer gets to look into things because there's another detective team who comes in and takes over the investigation and there's all of this like i don't know dynamic between them this tension there's so much happening in here, but it's also very repetitive. Like the same scene is happening over and over again. The discovery of this death, murder, is happening over and over again. I think it was extremely successful in everything that it set out to do. And then also finding out what actually was happening was, a, like, was it was surprising. Next up is CJ Tudor, just because I put her like kind of in the middle. I tend to pick up her books and I tend to like them. I think I always give them four stars. It's not an author that I get super excited to read, but every time I pick one up, I know it's gonna be good. And this one was no different. The Drift has three different scenes happening and you are reading about all of these people who are trapped in like a snowstorm or trapped in some type of way during the winter. One of them, you're at this like institution a chalet where people are coming we don't really know at the beginning like what they're coming to do what they actually do at this place um the retreat maybe is what they call it and we know that there's some type of like medical thing happening there you're following the people who work there and then you're following these people who are in this crashed bus and then you're following these people who are in a stuck snow cable car um, coming up the mountain and you're going to each scene, there's lots of deaths occurring, it, everyone's isolated, uh, there's a pandemic going on, there are these whistlers mentioned who are like maybe the villain of the story, maybe like sick from the pandemic, and it's just this action-packed like horror thriller and learning how everything is connected and the reason behind everything was super interesting. I did a whole vlog about it. Next up we have A Botanical Daughter by Noah Medlock. This was not exactly what I was expecting because I thought it was this like soft cottage core male male romance and they create this um daughter out of the greenery. One of them is a botanist, one of them is in taxidermy and they use whatever to create this this plant daughter and I thought it was going to be like sweet. So in fact it's more of a like gothic body horror. Oh my God. <laughs> the descriptions are really there, but it's also not like a romance. It is a queer romance, but in a different way than I thought, because what's actually happening between these two men is tension. Um, they have created this thing. It's very like Frankenstein vibes. We're talking about morality. We're talking about the way this daughter was created and the way that they're trying to figure out like if it's okay what they did and appeasing the other person and trying to like explain their opinions to each other and like what should be done with this creature. It was really stressful and it was also very slow. I gave it a four. I had a good time with it. I don't know if I'm explaining that well. I thought it would be much softer. Um, there was softness in a, in a different like relationship. The plentiful amount of academic explanations, that's what made it slow. Like the explanation of how like the, the stuff can even come to be, how it can make life, how it exists. It felt like uh, a mix of what moves the dead, and like kind of a bit of the honey witch, even though I didn't love that one, just cause the characters aren't very distinct, but their relationships are. And then maybe a bit of Emily Wilde because of the academia of it all. I would read more from this author. It needed to be edited a little bit. It, it was overwritten for sure. There was a lot you could have cut out of here, but I think I would, I would give another read. Next up, I do not have a physical copy of this one, Kill For Me, Kill For You by Steve Cavanaugh. I listened to the audiobook, and it's your traditional story 
of, you know, Strangers on a Train, referenced Strangers on a Train, it's not trying to steal the idea, of these two women who meet who have had something bad happen in the past to them and they want revenge, but they can't successfully kill the person they want revenge against without everybody knowing, you know, who did it because they have a past with them. So they agree to take out the other person for each other and they will have a really solid alibi for the moment that it happened. Everything's really planned out. And then at the same time, you're following this other woman who just had like a home invasion happen to her and she is trying to recover from that. And it's about her and her husband's dynamic. And I think that's all I can really tell you. There's twists and turns in here. I did see most of it coming, which was unfortunate, but I think this could be a really shocking plot twisty one for most people. I gave it a three and I would pick up more from him. We haven't yet moved into authors that I won't read from again. There's not too many of them. Let's get through the next ones quickly. Earth Eater by Dolores Reyes. This is about a girl who has the ability to um, eat dirt and then see visions of people who are missing or dead and get answers for their families. Uh, people try to take advantage of her and it's her trying to figure out um, if she wants to participate and what it's doing to her in her life. I gave it a four. I liked it. I would check out more from that author. Friday Black by Nana Kwame Ajay Brenya. Like, yes, I loved the novel I read from this author, but I guess I put this in the middle because I don't think I would read more short stories specifically. Uh, I don't even remember what any of these are about. So I just remember them being weird, but not in a great way. I reviewed it and like a good chunk of the stories in a vlog. I wanted to like this so much more than I did. Like it talks about racism, cultural unrest, the ways we fight for humanity and unforgiving world, consumerism. I think it like it touched on everything it wanted to. I just didn't have a great time when I thought that I would based on everybody's love for it. This is Our Moon, How Earth's Celestial Companion Transformed the Planet Guided Evolution and Made Us Who We Are by Rebecca Boyle. I gave this a four. I think if she came out with another nonfiction book about an item in our you know, general vicinity, I would probably read it. There was a lot for me to learn in here. It was a good chunk of stuff that I already knew, but you know, well described as an intelligent person would put together. And I just more than anything appreciate the skill that it takes to make a concept like this warm and inviting. It gave a lot of history of the moon, like in religion, in folklore, and how the moon actually exists and how we know everything that we do about the moon and who learned those things. Then I have The X Hex by Erin Sterling, which everybody has been telling me I'm not gonna like, and then I did, and I'm really happy for myself because I gave it a four. It follows a woman who put a curse on her ex and then her ex comes back to town and his curse is impacting him and a bunch of like people around and they have to work together to break the curse. It had a good amount of steam. It was rom-com vibes. It was very well set in fall, a perfect fall read, I think. And yeah, there was just a lot of moments of them trying to uncover the mystery of the curse. And we got a lot of their chemistry. I wish for a little more a little more banter and fun and like, oh my God, these people are so incredible together. Like I needed a little more of that and it would have been a five. Blackouts by Justin Torres. I only put this so low. Well, I put this one here because I figure I'll probably finish the trilogy someday, but I don't feel very motivated to do so. This one, like, yeah, I feel like I would read more from this author, I guess, but it was more the concept that was interesting. And I feel that way about the next couple books too. Like, I don't know much about the author. I didn't get excited about the author. I got excited about the concept. This one is just a conversation between two men. They are both gay, but different ages. So they move about the world in a similar way as far as the way they get treated, um, them trying to have relationships. They have a lot in common, a lot that they can connect on, but because they're from two very different times, they've had a very different experience growing up and accepting their sexualities and they just tell each other stories. It is a dialogue, not even heavy, a dialogue exclusive type of book where they're going back and forth telling each other things about their lives and telling the other person to like make it more interesting, make it more funny, make it more scary. And they just like explore all of these ideas and concepts. And throughout the pages, it's kind of mixed media. There's also, um, real medical texts and like learning about a history of homosexuality. There's also like blackout poetry from the actual book that exists and the author chose to create these other narratives. 
um, with that. And it was just an interesting read. And my perfect ending because at first I was frustrated by it because it feels like there's something happening in the background that will be explained. And it wasn't that kind of a book. It just ended. And I think that I ended up appreciating that because I can come up with whatever I want, whatever these stories really meant, whoever these men really were, what this conversation was to them. Uh, I can just decide for myself. And I think I want to read that a second time eventually. Ella Minope I put next because again, conceptually, this one was interesting. Uh, it wasn't about like, the, I don't know anything about this author. Mark done. It's a series of letters from these characters who live on this island who are controlled by like, there was this man in the past who created the phrase a quick, whatever it is, a quick dog jumps over the whatever, quick fox. I don't know what it is. But they use like every letter of the alphabet once. And when they have this statue dedicated to this person and that phrase, the letters begin to fall off because of age. The, um, you know, council decides that that is an indication that those letters should no longer be used as if they're getting a message from beyond. And it's about how the characters go about their lives changing their language and being censored in that way and just like how they deal with it and how they try to come up with their own you know, phrasing and try to be their own like figure in the community because if they come up with a better phrase that uses all of the alphabet words, then maybe uh, they can change the ways that the council treats them. It was a it was a really interesting time. I gave it a four. Then I have the mystery writer by Solari Gentile, which was really good for the first half. I had a really good time with this. I thought it would be great. I love books about books, and in this story, we have a woman who has just left her like law, not degree, but like the school that she was going to and the plans for her future and decides she wants to write a novel. She starts going to this cafe every day. She meets another author there. They become friends. They start becoming involved and she finds out that he is famous and then he dies. And now her and her brother are being implicated and she has to protect everybody. It gets really chaotic and a lot is happening all at once. We kind of have a different main character almost as the book continues. Um, the plot just wasn't going where I would have loved it. And all of the thrillery mystery things that I was liking just kind of changed and wasn't as good as what it was at the beginning. I, I struggle with this one because like as an author, I put her down here because even with the woman in the library, I just don't think either of these books fully met their potential. I gave this a three, I gave that one a 4.5. It's just like the ending, she does not stick the landing and it's so frustrating and makes me not want to pick up another one but i'm sure i will another similar one actually if you liked either one of these i would recommend the other to you this is almost surely dead by amina akhtar and this is another like chaotic kind of mystery it's about a woman who has had various people throughout her life like try to kill her and it's all very unexplained and weird there's a lot of folklore from her childhood we get a lot of her childhood her perspective as a child which I really did not like but again so much of the book I liked that I ended up giving it a three. I liked the podcast element there's people investigating her because she's currently missing and as the podcast explores her past and interviews all these people from her life we get an idea of what happened to her and all of these moments where people are seemingly trying to kill her and like is it a supernatural reason? Is somebody out to get her? What's happening? Everything gets answered but then again the ending the ending was not good. Like objectively, I don't know. I don't think I can even say it just wasn't to my taste. I don't think it's good. I don't think it's how it should have ended. And I'm still a little uh, butthurt about it. I then have Where I End by Sophie White. And I feel like I should say I would read from this author again. I know that she's like award winning, award nominated. And this book did accomplish what it set out to do. It made me extremely uncomfortable, but I chose not to rate it because I don't know how I feel about it. I like reading these weird disturbing books, but I don't like the weird disturbing books. I said that in the vlog and I don't know if it made any sense. I want to read things like this, but I didn't like it. It's about this woman who her mother is like this, I don't know, entity doesn't really feel like a human uh, who lives in her house and she's paralyzed, ill, unable to communicate, take care of herself. And our main character, oh shoot, what's her name? Uh, 
Eileen, she is caring for her for most of her life. Her grandmother took care of her mother and now she's at an age where she is responsible for it. And caring for her mother includes bathing her, feeding her. Um, she has to like lift her based like on a series of pulleys to get her into the bath. There's a lot involved. And it's not just that she's taking care of her in that way, but she's also like holding a lot of secrets. The people on the island think that her mother is dead and they're keeping up this ruse, but her father comes and stays with them sometimes and she has to like prop her mother up and prepare her mother. And it just all felt very sick and weird. <laughs> and the body horror involved in this was some of the most like visceral I've ever read. The things that she was doing to her mother's body, the parts of her body she was touching, cleaning, scraping off, like exposing. It was so fucking gross. And then the ending was truly unhinged. Like I was not expecting where I thought it was just going to be like a sad, like weird kind of story. It was, but it got like really dark and really sad. And this woman is just trying to find a place for herself in the world and becomes kind of obsessed with another woman who comes to the island. It, it was all just like so weird. Next up, I want to talk to you about the familiar. Now it is low on here. Okay. But I gave this a 3.5. I think it was fine. This is just me acknowledging that I have never loved a Leigh Bardugo. I've never given Leigh Bardugo five stars, but I've read so much of her stuff. And she's obviously such a prolific author and she's so well known, so beloved. Everybody's reading her and I just like always want to pick up her stuff, but I never love it. And I think I have to cut myself off from a Leigh Bardugo unless, hear me out, she writes like a really epic romance one day because I feel like her books make me feel like she wants to do that. I don't think her books ever set out to be romances, but the strongest part about them in my mind is the connection between the main characters. But she's so good at world building and plot and concepts that that's the point. She's writing these fantasy books and she's a great fantasy author, but I want her to just write something romantic that I can really like just obsess over because I get moments of these romances that are so good and I just want the book to then become that. So this is set in the 16th century. It is during the Spanish Inquisition and we have this character who is kind of a servant for this family and she has a lot of fear. Uh, obviously people can come in and take people at any moment for no reason uh, away from their homes. People are so many people are dying and she is extra in fear because she has this magical ability. Uh, it's very seemingly small. She can just change little things. But when her the person who is responsible for her owns her essentially, um, finds out about that, she wants to use that to her advantage uh, to have a higher station in life. What I didn't know about this book, I just heard it was like historical fantasy. Uh, I didn't know that it would be related to like a competition, which was a really nice surprise. But then the competition was not like as fully fleshed out as I needed it to be. She gets taken to like the royal whoever and has to perform these magical skills it's kind of against her will, but then decides to go along with it for various reasons. And there are other people there who are also performing this, these magical things, but the magic isn't like, it's not a magic system. It's not explained. Everyone has a different kind of ability and they all are just working to get to like the highest level. And I loved Lucia and the relationship she gets into with the familiar um, as a character, but the rest of it was all just fine. Like I was just reading it. It was a good time. I think obviously she's a fantastic writer. She built atmosphere. She gave beautiful quotes. Everything was good. It just like wasn't exactly the story that I needed it to be to love it. Characters are not super distinct in here. They're all just kind of there, all the side characters. But the story was interesting. It was very slow, very, very slow, like a slow gothic novel. I hope people go into it with the right kind of expectations. But once I found out what it was and like met the characters and had these little moments of relationship, that's what I wanted it to become. And it wasn't, so that's unfair, but I gave it a three. <laughs> Next on my list, another gothic book that I gave a three is 
Diavola. I know the audiobook because I exclusively listened to the audiobook pronounced it differently, but I can't remember how it was pronounced now by Jennifer Thorne. This is a haunting possession gothic story. It starts out on vacation and it just wasn't everything that I wanted it to be. Basically, you have this family and it's a lot of family dynamics. We have this main character who uh, the family doesn't really respect. She doesn't have like as important of a life according to other people and she doesn't get treated the same. She's in a kind of caretaking role on this trip for her sister's children. And it was just a lot more like motherhood, exhausted motherhood, nanny type of content than what I'm really looking for. And after they go on this vacation, which is a different like amount of the book than I thought, I think, um, is how I would explain why it wasn't exactly what I wanted. After it, there is this lingering like haunting. It was tense. It was kind of interesting. There was, uh, she felt very like unloved and very unwanted and felt isolated and on her own. The cover is just giving like haunting, scary, oh my god, and that's not really what the story was. So I, I just thought it was okay. Would I read from more from this author? I I don't think so just because I didn't really like the writing. It didn't do anything for me. An author that I don't think that I'll read again, at least in this series, uh, is Bryn Weaver for Butcher and Blackbird. I wanted to like this. I think it wasn't the perfect tone for me because I went into it feeling like okay dark comedy satire funny like I'm in on it and then it took itself I think I really think it took itself seriously by the end and forgot that it was trying to be funny but it is about two serial killers who meet and they decide that they're going to get together once a year to take out a serial killer and have a little competition not, it's not really a competition. It doesn't, like, that's not the plot of the book. It's just them, like, lusting over each other for a long time and going back and forth. Like, a really traditional romance of, like, he can't possibly like me. I'm so insecure. And then him being like, oh my god, she's the sexiest thing I've ever seen. Can't wait to see your tits again. The first half of this really had me. I thought, I can be on board for this. It could be fun. And then I didn't like anything about it. It also was not as dark and, like, gory as... I was led to believe. And the author that I am not going to read ever again is Lisa Jewell. And it's not just because of like, I'm not offended by this book. I don't think it was the worst thing I ever read. Uh, I don't, I don't agree with the way that the author handled multiple things. But I like, I don't know if that's her, you know, opinion or the people in the book or whatever. It's not about the actual content of this. It's just that this is like my fourth Lisa Jewell that I have not liked. And why do I keep reading them? I have to cut myself off from this author and recognize that there is something that people are looking for that I am not in this genre because I just do not enjoy her books. This is another story of obsession. We have a podcast host and a woman who's had a very dark life. Uh, that, at least that's what she tells her at the beginning. She says, I have a husband who you know, found me when I was 15 and he was 40. We got together, we've had this tumultuous kind of history and I wanna tell my story on your podcast. So they meet up together regularly and she exposes all of her history, um, her stuff with her children, and then we find out the truth about everything. And <laughs> I just think this is one of the most dull books. I didn't find these characters interesting enough to want to learn about. I didn't think that enough was kept from us as the reader. I didn't enjoy the pace of it. I don't think it was unreadable, which is why I'm giving it a two, not a one. This wasn't a hate read. Just the entire time I was like, but what's the point? Are we getting to like a moment that's going to be really impactful, really wild, really shocking? The answer was no. I can recognize that this is a skilled author for other people. Other people see it and I don't need to. As I say all the time, my taste in thrillers, people are confused by all the time. So I'm not out here to yuck anybody's yum. And that's everything that I read in the month of April. It was not my best reading month. Even the things I gave a four, I don't feel a lot of passion for. So hopefully things will turn around for May. Wish me a lot of luck. I have so many goals for how to find the best reads that I can. And I think I'm going to be successful. I really feel it. Watch my next video is going to be titled like the five star drought. The five star drought is over. Living my best life. Five star, five star, five star reads across the board. Oh my God. <laughs> so I'll see you then. That, well, I think I have a couple videos between now and my next reading vlog, but 
I will see you and I, I wish myself the best. Bye!